Chapter 2 Our journey ended shortly after daybreak the next morning. A voice on the loudspeaker announced that we had arrived in Hefei. You are, you are almost home now, Mama, Papa said. He pulled our bag from the rack, grasped me tightly and asked, Are you ready? Mm, yes, I replied, yet I had no idea what I was supposed to be ready for, except to see Grandma and Mama and my sisters. Papa had me lock my arms around his neck as he pushed his way out of the car, through the station and onto the street. In the brisk winter wind, I felt a cold draft on my feet. I suddenly remembered removing my shoes during the night and letting them fall to the floor. I'd forgotten them there. I pulled Papa's collar and told him, My shoes are on the train. What? He asked in disbelief and looked at my bare feet. He glanced at the crowded station and sighed. Ah, we'll just have to get you new ones. He undid a button on his jacket and had me stick my feet inside to keep them warm. We boarded a bus and stood in the aisle for half an hour before getting off near a cluster of buildings. We approached one of them. Papa read the numbers over on the entrance and it said, Your mama and papa live here with your brother. You will live here too. I was frightened by his word. No, I said, they don't. I know where Mama and Papa live. Let's go meet them, he replied. I want to go home, I said in a tremulous voice. Take me to Grandma. Mama, he said, listen to me. Don't call me Papa anymore. I am not your Papa. I'm your second uncle. I searched his eyes, confused. I waited for him to say this was a game. From now on, you must call me second uncle, he said. Tears spilled down my face. I wrapped my arms tightly around his neck. No, I cried. Don't, don't give me away, Papa. I'll be a good girl. I won't say I'm hungry again. No, no, no. I clung to him, sobbing. He patted my back and said, It's okay, Mama. It's okay. Papa carried me up the stairs to the second floor and knocked on the door. It swung open and a boy stood before us. Papa gave his name and a moment later there was a flurry of footsteps and a man and a woman appeared at the door. The woman gasped. What a surprise! I buried my face in Papa's coat. He touched my arm and said, Mama, come, come, come to Mama. She's so 
sounded kind, the man beside her watched me through thick, black-rimmed glasses. Little Mama, do you remember me? He asked. I shook my head. I am your papa, he said. I studied the two adults and the boy. Confused and apprehensive, the woman said, "Come ye, come ye. You must be hungry and tired." She knelt and picked up my doll, without noticing. I dropped her. Before handing it to me, she said, "I gave you this doll, Mama." You remember? She's afraid, Papa said, and she's shy. He carried me down the hall to a room, where a table was set up, with stools around it. Where's Grandma? I asked. There was no answer to my question. The woman said, "Mama, come here." Papa handed me to her. I struggled to hang on to him, but he pried my arms loose. As she pulled me to her, she saw my bare feet and asked, "Where are her shoes?" I'm afraid we lost them on the train. Papa said, "I'll find something for her." The woman said. She carried me into a small adjoining room. She set me on the bed, and put a pair of slippers on my feet. She told me, "Mama, walk slowly, and they'll stay on, and keep your feet warm." She took my hand and helped me slide from the bed. I stayed close to her, but as we walked from the room, my feet came out of the slippers. I stopped and reached back with each feet, felt around with my toes, and put the slippers on. Without using my hands, she laughed, side by side, and hand in hand, taking small steps, so my slippers stayed on. We joined the others. Chapter three. I didn't realize how hungry I was until I was seated. At the table, and the food was placed before me. I eagerly devoured my entire serving. When I held up my bowl, I asked for more. Everyone looked at me. There's no more, Mama. Mama said, and then. Listen to that Tianjin accent. Are the children here? Are not going to understand her. That evening, second uncle and Papa set up a white wooden crib. Mama put me in it. My new brother, whose name was Yi Ding, slept with my parents in their bed. And second uncle slept in the bed beside the crib. I lay in my crib and listened to the adults in the next room. I remember when you brought her to Tianjin. Second uncle said, February, nineteen sixty. Mama said, it broke my heart. But what could I do? If I'd kept her with me, 
we would have all starved. I know, second uncle sighed. She was only one and a half, Mama said. She's been with us for two years, second uncle said. We're the only family she knew. She'll need time to adjust. I heard the scratch of a match and smelled cigarette smoke. Our mother starved herself for Mama, second uncle said. I tried to stop her, tried to get mother to eat her food, but she found a way to give it to Mama. We talked about it, the brothers and sisters. We concluded that the best solution was to bring Mama back to you. These words reminded me of an episode a few days earlier. I had been playing hide and seek with my sisters. I crept into my bedroom and hid behind the clothing inside a large wardrobe. I heard footsteps. A moment later, Grandma and second uncle started talking a few feet from me. She's killing you, second uncle said. No, Grandma replied. She's no trouble. She's a blessing. I know what I see, second uncle said, after pause and the rustling of paper. He said, I bought this at the black market. You give her most of your food. She's healthy and you are not. Promise me, you will eat this. Oh, I will. I will, she promised. Second uncle left. I stepped from the wardrobe. Grandma looked up and smiled. Come here, she whispered. I hurried to her and she said, eat this quickly. She held out a small packet of roasted peanuts wrapped in newspaper. I stuffed some in my mouth. Grandma held the others as I chewed and swallowed, and she urged, quickly, quickly. Before I was finished, second uncle returned. What is this? He asked. He smelled my breath. Mama is my granddaughter. Grandma said, as if that explained everything. This cannot continue, second uncle said. Then he left the room. Grandma fed me the remaining peanuts one at a time. She watched as I severed them. Her expression changed from delight. She pulled me to her and stroked my hair and cried. She rocked me back and forth and repeated, I don't want them to take you away, Mama. As she whispered the words, I cried. I don't want them to take me away, Grandma. I want to stay with you. I was unsure who them were and where they might take me. But I was afraid and I clung to her. After several minutes, she brushed away her tears and wiped my, wife, my face clean. Play with your sisters, she said. Grandma needs her rest. Voices from the next room 
interrupted my memory of Tianjin. I'm sorry, Mama said. Mother lost weight. She became listless. We brought in a doctor to examine her. He said she had edema as a result of malnutrition. Most of her food was going into Mama's mouth. We could not let her die for her granddaughter. You did the right thing, Papa said. How did Mother react when you said you were bringing Mama here, Mama asked. We couldn't tell her. So you said nothing? Mama asked. Ikai, second uncle said. We decided that break the news later. She will cry and sock, but in time she'll accept it. Then she'll start eating and regain his health. How serious are the food shortage in Tianjin? Mama asked. We don't have enough, second uncle said. Nobody does, but we are alive. It's the same everywhere this famine. He went on in a lower voice. Four years of it, four long years. Peasants come into Tianjin. They sell what they have. They beg. They sell their children. And when they can't find a buyer, I don't like to think about it. We find them on the street, along the river, on the train tracks. It's the same here, Mama said. The black market is all that separates us from starvation. Nothing else. The three of us, I mean, the four of us now, has to live on my salary. Will you work again, Ningkun? Second uncle asked Papa. I don't know, Papa answered. No work, no salary, no medical care. How many have died? Mama asked. Papa said, many millions. Many. That's what I've heard and I believe it. I've heard it too, second uncle said. Why? Mama said. Can you explain it? Haven't you heard? It's the weather, second uncle said. That's the official explanation. What about the weather? Mama asked. Has your weather changed? Second uncle asked. Is there a flood here? A drought? No. Mama and Papa answered at the same time. It's not the weather, second uncle said. Will it ever end? Mama asked. We can hope, second uncle said. All we have left Mama sighed. Yes, second uncle responded. There was a long silence. Then the light was switched off, and second uncle came into the room and lay down on the bed beside my crib. Papa, I said. Mama, he answered, you're still awake. Are we going to see Grandma tomorrow? Mama, 
he said. I'm second uncle, remember? Second uncle, I said. Are we going to see grandma tomorrow? Mm. No, we're not. Are we going to stay here? This is your home. You are going to live here. But I want Grandma, I cried. Take me home to Grandma. Please, I promise I will never eat her peanuts again. Go to sleep, Mama, he said. Good night, he turned away and covered himself with a blanket. The next morning, the man who had been my papa and become my second uncle was gone. I was alone with my new family. 大家好，我是周航。啊，乌衣毛女士的这本书的英文版《Feather in the Storm》已经由蓝灯书屋出版。呃，中文版《暴风雨中一羽毛》，呃，已经绝版。我们现在打算重印。我们做好准备以后会公布购买事宜，请大家跟我联系，发信到赵民邮箱，赵民的汉语拼音全拼，然后是阿拉伯数字幺零四八五七六 at gmail com。